Welcome to Geographical Analysis, Lecture 11, Basic Elements of Sampling. First we'll go over a few uh, definitions. These are all things that we've seen before. Recall that a population is the universe of all individuals, and a sample is a subset or portion of individuals selected from the population for more detailed analysis. And then inferential statistics has a goal to infer characteristics of the population from information obtained in a sample. So why do we need samples? First of all, large-sized populations necessitate sampling because completing a total enumeration is impossible. Think of, think of collecting information about the population of the world. That population is constantly changing, and it would be impossible just from practical purposes to collect information about every individual living on the planet. By the time you've started your sample, some people have died and new people have been born. Two, sampling is efficient and cost-effective, both in terms of the cost associated with collecting data, such as, uh, such as man hours or equipment, and two, in the analysis stage. If we have a larger data set, we're going to require more, we're going to incur more costs for data storage and computational costs in, in calculating statistics about our data sets. Three, sampling allows for a more in-depth analysis. That's because when we're dealing with a smaller sample, we can go into more detail or spend more time with each individual respondent to collect more detailed information about, about each respondent. This wouldn't be possible if we were trying to collect information about a larger sample or from the population. Four, sampling allows for repeated collection of information quickly and inexpensively. So we've already seen the quickly and inexpensive part. But what about this repetition part? A lot of polling companies try to monitor public opinion by, com by conducting small sample surveys, but maybe on a daily basis, in order to gauge the pulse of the attitudes of the population of a country. Five, smaller samples allow for higher degrees of quality control and accuracy. Because we are dealing with fewer data records, we're able to ensure higher standards uh, with less cost than we were if we were trying to ensure those high standards on a larger data set. All samples come with, with what we call sampling error. And recall that sampling error is a difference between the measured results and, those, and the true results of the population. The goal of, of sampling is to conduct a representative sample or it's often to collect a representative sample. And this goal is to re accurately reflect the actual characteristics of the population without any bias. Bias, in this sense, is a difference between the sampled characteristics and the population characteristics. When you're conducting, s when you're reading over reports uh, or survey results, you'll often see a comparison between some baseline population characteristics that we know to be true and those characteristics that, are, that, are, that we receive in a sample. And by comparing the population characteristics, say from a census survey, to those in your sample, we can assess whether or not there is bias in our data collection. So in this case, we can see that we've slightly oversampled higher income families. And depending on our research goals, that may or may not affect the, use, the usefulness of our sample. This graph shows the relationship that exists between sample size, precision, and cost. Along the bottom of the graph, we have sample size. On the left-hand side, small samples, and on the right-hand side, large samples. If we look at the cost curve in red, we see that the cost of collecting a sample increases from low cost to high cost as the sample size increases. At the same time, we see that precision increases with sample size. So in green, we have small samples resulting in lower levels of precision. And as we increase the sample size, our samples are more precise. Here, by precision, we mean how sure we are that the characteristics that we collect in our sample match those of the population. There are many different sources of sampling error. Uh, these include non-response bias which is when some subgroup of the population is more likely to respond than others. A typical, a typical example from 
Social surveys is that those with more time on their hands are more likely to say yes or to agree to, con to be a participant in a survey. So here, in many social service surveys, we find that we oversample, say, retired people with more time on their hands or people who aren't in the workforce. Response bias exists when respondents provide inaccurate answers to questions. For example, when surveying a population about sensitive issues, perhaps about sexual preference or feelings of racism, people are likely to people are sometimes going to lie on the survey to say that they're not gay or that they're not racist when in fact they are. These are examples of response bias. Coverage bias is when some portion of the population accidentally is ignored by the sampling procedure. So for example, we c if we conduct our survey by calling people's home phones, we're inadvertently not collecting data about people who don't have home phones. This is becoming a big issue in the sampling world as people move away from home phones and only have cell phones. Sampling errors also exist. These are the human or technological mistakes or inconsistencies made when collecting data or when transcribing or transforming data from paper records into a computer format. We've already discussed sources of sampling error in previous sections about data accuracy and precision.